listening to episode 123 of Mighty Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I'm interviewing Lauren De La Cruz of Innate Functional Nutrition once again. While there is complexity to a lot of people's health conditions, and there's usually not just one cause, but multiple causes, emotional, spiritual, multiple physical causes, but I think a lot of people will overlook the mineral aspect of health and the burn rates specifically, how fast you're burning through your minerals, whether that be sodium, potassium, magnesium, or any of the other minerals. Copper is usually a big one. But in this episode, we focus on the macro minerals and Lauren shares her wisdom, what she's been learning through working with clients on mineral balancing and the powerful fast effects that can happen when you start regulating and balancing your mineral status. So we talked quite a bit about supplements and how supplementing specific minerals, usually it's calcium, but it can be others, will push the other ones out of balance. And depending on the context of the situation, that could be a bad thing. So Lauren goes through the four main minerals, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and calcium. And we answer questions that people have sent in about the best natural sports drink. Uh, Do you need to supplement or can you get all your minerals from food? If we have calcification, does that mean we should eat low calcium foods? Uh, Thoughts on pearl powder, calcium suggestions when dairy is an issue and you can't do greens. She talks about magnesium, which forms to avoid, what forms are safe during pregnancy, uh, the different effects of magnesium on the body and hormonal balance, sodium retention, uh, talk about sea salt quite a bit, the different types of salt, and why you probably want to choose a white salt, and many more. This episode is just jam-packed. Definitely have your notes ready. And here is Lauren De La Cruz. All right, Lauren De La Cruz, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me again, Matt. Yeah, thanks for uh, taking the time to share your wisdom. And you've been taking Morley Robbins' uh, course for a while, right? Yes. Well, I actually, I took it last January and graduated in April. So I've been just kind of (laughs) uh, utilizing the knowledge that I've gained in that course and using it with my clients. And it's been wonderful. Yeah, it's a really uh, uh, big piece. Uh, That's why I've had Morley on my show so many times is when you get even just like the iron, copper, magnesium piece, uh, so much can fall, fall together. Um, Mm -hmm. but I also wanted to talk about, um, uh, potassium, calcium, sodium, and chloride, uh, just the, the major, I guess you can call the macro minerals or electrolytes. Um, cause I feel like there's so much uh, misinformation and, and disinformation about them. And would you say that, um, most people are, experiencing electrolyte imbalance um, or, or a deficiency in one or several of these minerals, and that is part of the root cause of their chronic illness? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, as you've probably heard Morley say before, uh, minerals runs enzyme, run enzymes which run hormones. And so if there's any sort of hormonal imbalance or, you know, a symptom, there's likely usually a mineral component tied to it. Uh, Just because minerals are the spark plugs of the body, they allow vitamins to do their job, they allow hormones to do their job, and that runs the rest of the body. So uh, usually, you know, if you're looking down further the line, um, there's always something going on. And uh, I would say that, you know, I personally, I'm a hair tissue mineral analysis uh, practitioner, and I've literally never seen anyone with balanced minerals. So, you know, it's definitely something to work (laughs) towards, um, whether it's realistic to achieve uh, 100% balance 100% of the time. I I don't know. Um, But 
striving to balance them better and replenish and support the body with the right things, that's always going to be beneficial no matter what. Wow. That, that, that's probably hard to believe for many people that, uh, you've never seen a balanced, uh, HTMA, uh, result, <laughs> <laughs> but <Yep. laughs> a lot of it's probably caused by like, like fat or extreme dieting. Like I came from like the one, one hour a day eating window, like extreme mm-hmm. one meal a day, um, and keto and intermittent fasting. And I skipped breakfast for probably five, six years straight, um, mm-hmm. restricted protein for about that same period of time, restricted sugar and like large stretches, either sugar, or protein or calories. And there's like an adrenal connection, right? Like, so is it sodium and potassium are drained when the adrenals are pumping out uh, adrenaline? And Yeah, so that's a really great question. Uh, there, so in hair tissue mineral analysis testing, there are ratios. Sodium and pota- potassium are generally adrenal supportive uh, minerals, but the ratio for the adrenals is actually um, sodium and magnesium. So when we look at the adrenals, we're looking at the sodium and magnesium ratio. But to answer your question, yes, uh, when stress occurs, what will happen is the body starts losing sodium. And so that'll start to fall. And the body's trying to retain it, of course, with aldosterone, um, which is a hormone that helps retain sodium in the body. And, um, what happens is the body will try to retain sodium, but it, it's burning through it pretty quickly. And so potassium will try to meet it. And so you'll start to lose potassium as well. Um, and, you know, it, that can kind of indicate also what stage of stress you're in sometimes. Uh, so depending on the ratios and depending on the levels, you, you know, acute stress could be low sodium and falling potassium. Uh, but you know, when you start to see things, um, sort of even out, that's when you're nearing more an advanced state of stress and you're pretty much becoming really depleted. Um, of course, you know, there are differences in oxidizers. So there's fast oxidizers, there's slow oxidizers, slow oxidizers will have a more, a more of a propensity to burn through sodium and potassium, whereas fast oxidizers will have more of a propensity to burn through magnesium and calcium. Um, but uh, regarding the adrenals, you know, this is why it's also really important to consider not over supplementing magnesium uh, because the, the adrenal ratio is sodium and magnesium. If we uh, supplement too much magnesium, and we're not working on getting our sodium and potassium up, which really should be supported at the same time because likely they're both being depleted uh, actively, <laughs> um, then the magnesium to sodium ratio will be off. And that's when people will start to feel crappy when they take magnesium supplements. So I know that was probably very technical, <laughs> but I, I hope that helps kind of illustrate, you know, it's not just about a specific ratio or one specific mineral all the time. It's They all really work harmoniously. And if we over supplement one too, that can also potentially cause imbalances in the others. And there are many more ratios as well, like the thyroid ratio, the blood sugar ratio, vitality ratio, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it can kind of affect all of these other systems in the body. No, that was awesome. And uh, would you say that like slow oxidizers, um, it's easier because you were saying fast oxidizers burn through magnesium, and calcium. So does that mean like it, fast oxidizers, it's it's a little harder for them to over supplement magnesium because they're burning through it? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. They usually need a little bit more replenishment um, mm. or to focus on replenishment in those areas more so than a slow oxidizer. But, yeah. you know, fast oxidizers could also be losing sodium and magnesium sodium and potassium very quickly as well. So it's kind of looking at the whole picture rather than just one marker. But yes, you are correct. Uh, They'd probably be fine in taking a little bit more. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, I I questioned for years the the whole oxidizer thing. Um, Is it something you find to just be true? Or is it like a theory? Because, you know, it's kind of like body types. Uh, you know, like Dr. Kassinger, I've had on the show, has like the carrot type, the 
you're either a carrot, a pear, or an apple. And that's like the shape of your body. And he says there's mm -hmm. like thyroid types, adrenal types, and uh, combo types or something. And um, yeah, is that just something you've seen to be true? The, the, the fact that people are either slow or fast oxidizers in looking at, at people's labs or? It's, it's a helpful uh, marker and it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily going to define everything because usually most people are in the gray. So there's fast and slow, but neither one is better than the other. So you don't want to be fast or you don't want to be slow. You want to be balanced. And so it, it can help in terms of guiding. Okay. Maybe this person is, you know, definitely in a sympathetic state. So fast oxidizers usually potentially are in a much more sympathetic state where slow oxidizers are in a parasympathetic state. And so it kind of indicates also the, whether they're anabolic or catabolic um, and um, the kind of level of stress that they're experiencing. So fast oxidizers, what I've seen is if they don't take care of or address their mineral imbalances, they can eventually become slow oxidizers. Um, and I should say 80% of the population is a slow oxidizer or are slow oxidizers. So um, fast oxidizers are kind of rare <laughs> to see, um, but it's usually indicative of, you know, somebody that's actively in a uh, sympathetic state. And again, you know, neither one is best uh, when I sometimes when I'm with a client and they're like, oh, I'm a slow oxidizer. Darn. <laughs> they're so upset. But, you know, that doesn't mean necessarily that that's better than a fast oxidizer. You want to go for balance. And so what it can do is help guide things. But some people are closer to balance than others. Uh, so it's just another thing to utilize. I don't, you know, uh, live fast and hard by fast oxidizer, slow oxidizer necessarily. And it's, it's directly linked to the metabolism. Is that, is that right? Like how quickly you're burning through energy or how quickly you utilize your fuel? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. it is. And it's, you know, usually fast oxidizers will also burn through uh, copper or zinc much faster than a slow oxidizer would. They can probably handle a little bit more over supplementation of certain minerals, um, whereas slow oxidizers, it might um, it might cause o overload the system a little bit. We have to go a little bit slower with them just because the system can get overwhelmed. And um, you know, giving somebody magnesium, for example, a slow oxidizer. Uh, several case studies, more or less, talked about this as well. I've seen this with clients too. Um, giving somebody that's a slow oxidizer and that's truly, truly slow uh, can kind of cause a detoxification reaction because it's kind of like waking up the beast because <laughs> there's been so many processes and enzymes that have been sort of sleeping because of the lack of mineral supplementation or support. So that's kind of, you know, uh, I think for the fast oxidizers, you can kind of go a little bit faster. Slow oxidizers, you kind of have to move a little bit slower. <laughs> That makes sense. And I like on, on your Instagram, you've done like product reviews, uh, of, of supplements and oh. <laughs> uh, we, we have a shared fascination with that. Cause I'm, I love reading labels and it's like a kid in the candy store when I'm in like the supplement section of a health food store. I'll, I'll, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of depressing, but it's also fascinating to me because I'm just like, how are we in this st like place where, you know, 80, 90% of supplements are just creating imbalances. It's, it's kind of insane, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> kind of the more ingredients, right? Like I, I heard someone say the other day in an interview, like the more ingredients a supplement has, um, the, the generally, I mean, you're getting less of the active ingredients, so it's less likely to work well, but you're most mm -hmm. likely also going to have some issues, whether it's an allergic reaction. So that's why I like single supplements, just only one ingredient and it might seem basic, but it's a little bit more effective and safer. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's hard to know, you know, if you're reacting, if a supplement makes you feel bad and there's one ingredient, then okay, it's easy to tell. But if there's multiple ingredients, which are becoming more and more common, like these adrenal combos or these liver combos or these 
you know, all coverage of mineral combos <laughs> um, and somebody feels really crappy on them, it's really difficult to tell whether it was, you know, the a one ingredient, <laughs> uh, which could be derived from any number of um, allergenic substances um, versus like a singular supplement, an ingredient. Yeah, for years, I was taking a really popular uh, nootropic one it starts with a Q, I won't say the name, but it has like literally <laughs> you take like eight capsules or something and it's, it's like eight or I think nine capsules literally. And it was like 40, 50 ingredients, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, they had D3 in there, which to me is oh, yeah. poison. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and maybe some synthetic A or who knows. But it's just when you have that many, I mean, there's always going to be a few. I mean, with minerals, we're really talking about the forms, which people tend to be confused about, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure you get this question every day, like, oh, what form of this mineral is best? Uh, and there's right. no best form, right? They're just more effective and less effective. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, <laughs> more effective, less effective. Um, <laughs> or harmful. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, when it comes to magnesium, you know, I feel like a lot of people take oxide or the mm -hmm. cit um, uh, cit uh, magnesium citrate. There we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which can actually be pretty irritating for some people. So it's mm -hmm. it's not even that, you know, that yes, they can be less effective or more effective, but also um, your body can respond differently to depending on the state of healing you're in as well uh, as the quality of the mineral in the form. Mm. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why the subject's so fun is because, I mean, you, we could have a million episodes on minerals and still be just scratching the surface, right? Because there's mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of enzymes that are running on different minerals and mineral ratios, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So true. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this is a good question someone sent in. Um, what are signs of mineral deficiencies? That's really broad, but um, can you see it like on the nails or on the skin or in the eyes or visually? That's a really good question. Um, well, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> uh, what are some signs or clues? Uh, if you have a diagnosis, there is probably a mineral deficiency for sure. Um, I would say definitely nails. So nails can be a great marker. They're not like super accurate, I would say. I, I'm not a nail reader per se, but <laughs> I'm not a tea leaf reader either. I feel like looking at nails is kind of like reading tea leaves, but um, it, they can for sure. Because when I was on the birth control pill, for example, and this is a very common um, symptom that people experience, weak, weak nails, ridges in nails. Um, and I was absolutely 100% mineral deficient. I had cracks on the side of my mouth. That's a vitamin deficiency, but also, you know, it could also be correlated to a mineral deficiency because minerals help vitamins do their job, um, especially the fat soluble ones. Um, uh, brittle hair, for example, that could be, or like hair loss, that could be it. Um, dry skin, uh, constipation. Um, what else? What else? Uh, fatigue, uh, getting up at night to go to the bathroom or having to urinate often throughout the day. Um, those aren't necessarily physical, uh, visible signs, but those are physical signs that you may have a mineral deficiency. Um, feeling really exhausted after a workout or cramps, um, any kind of cramping. Um, quick fatigue during workouts or activities as well, uh, or muscular fatigue. That could also be a mineral deficiency. Um, let's see. T tooth, <laughs> tooth decay, cavities, mineral deficiencies, also fat soluble vitamins, but again, they work together. Um, uh, I would say, uh, hmm. I would say those cover a pretty wide range, but you know, those are things that people experience that they may not connect to mineral deficiency. Um, high blood pressure, very easily a mineral deficiency. I can't tell you how many clients I've worked with that come to me with high blood pressure and we we replenish their minerals and they're like, oh my gosh, 
it's gone. <laughs> it's <magic>. <laughs> <laughs> I have normal blood pressure. Uh, yes, because <laughs> minerals are in charge of regulating <laughs> that um, for the most part. And so um, uh, PMS cramping, that could also be another one. Um, uh, blood sugar issues as well. So insulin resistance, uh, that can also go with the frequent urination. But, um, you know, carbohydrate intolerance, that's a huge one for mineral deficiency. Um, uh, to kind of go back to one of the questions that you asked too, or, or maybe it was a statement, but low carb or um, ketogenic diets can also cause extreme mineral deficiency as well. And that's kind of why you see them supplementing potassium all the time. Um, acidosis, that kind of stuff, uh, which, you know, again, blood sugar issues can really, really wreak havoc, especially in potassium. Um, so if you're in a low carb diet, it's, it's very well known and very well accepted too. It's not really a, a mystery or, or a secret that uh, low carb diets do deplete minerals uh, pretty, pretty harshly. So you really have to be aware if you're on a low carb diet to replenish actively more so than your normal person. And that can be a job. <laughs> Those are so, really good points. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I forget where I heard it, but sugar, is it true? Or is, are you, um, do you agree with this that sugar replen uh, like recycles like 40% of magnesium? Forget where I heard that. But. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that as well. I do know that once your metabolism is in a better state, you can retain magnesium better. And that's very easily um, seen through the ratios because it all has to do with the ratios. Uh, if, you're, if your sodium and potassium are low, your adrenal ratio is going to be pr probably pretty high because um, you're trying to retain sodium, you're also losing magnesium at the same time, you know, eventually things can be, start to become imbalanced, but um, usually it's a high sodium to magnesium ratio and you're just losing, losing, losing because you're in this stressed state. And so you really have to work on replenishing. That's why the, the core, four core minerals or the master minerals, uh, chloride isn't usually included in those, that core um, type or naming convention, but, um, it is an important piece too. And it's usually tied to, um, sodium, right? It's like salt NACL. So you're, it's kind yes. of, if you're eating salt, you, you won't really be chloride. I mean, if you're, if you are, if, if you're not salting your food, which that was one of the questions, isn't salt free healthier? <laughs> Oh gosh, uh, <laughs> that is like one of the biggest, <laughs> the biggest fat lies ever. Um, salt free is not healthier. Um, that goes back to you know, <laughs> uh, I think we like to demonize um, a specific thing for our problems, and I feel like that's what happened with salt. And so, yes, you know, it it, it can go back to probably the increased consumption of processed foods um, and uh, maybe fast food as well. But salt is so important. We need it. It was um, people, you know, our ancestors fought wars over it. <laughs> and I think salt used to mean money mm -hmm. in some culture. Um, mm -hmm. So salt was like this really incredibly prized thing to, to have. And rightly so, it's so important for our health. Um, we would literally die without it. The first thing you get when you're dehydrated is you you get uh, saline uh, salt. <laughs> uh, so I think salt and sugar in the hospital. I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure salt is definitely in there. Um, but yeah, so salt free is not necessarily better it's when we consume too much salt in relation to potassium that yes, that's, that's for sure. We can have blood pressure problems, but it, you know, removing salt is not necessarily the answer. It's increasing the potassium levels. And so I, I honestly think most people don't get enough salt, but they're also definitely not getting enough potassium. So, um, you know, it, it kind of looking at the bigger picture, um, Yes, there are actually, okay, so let me backtrack. There are some sodium chloride sensitive people, um, but I think it's only 
10 to 15 percent of the population or 10 to 15 percent of people that have blood pressure issues. So it's a very small number of people. And what I've also found is that the, the research says, too, is that it's actually potassium chloride can also increase blood pressure the same way sodium chloride increases blood pressure in these people. So it may actually be the chloride. <laughs> um, that these people are chloride sensitive, not necessarily sodium sensitive. That said, chloride is extremely important for the body. Um, it's inc incredibly important to digestion. Uh, the body cannot properly digest food without chloride. So, you know, it again, it's not about, okay, <laughs> oh my gosh, chloride is terrible. Let me stop eating it. Um, no, the body needs it. And you're probably not one of those people that are sensitive to it. Yeah, Adam Adam Bergstrom said we like to demonize uh, short, like four or five letter words, like uh, like salt, sugar, fat, you know, <laughs> like. Uh, <yeah. laughs> and now we have like monk fruit and like all these crazy things and xylitol and you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yesterday actually we we put on the lake uh, two fifty pound uh, huge salt blocks. Um, to attract uh, deer and elk and moose because they'll go and oh. lick the salt block and mm -hmm. then it makes them thirsty. And so they'll go to the water. And so, you know, easier to hunt them, but also if you just want to see them. <laughs> so. That's so cool. That's you're also helping them reproduce, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> um, one of the things that farmers do is they've been able to basically eradicate um, uh, losses in births on the farm. Uh, almost to like 98% or 99% uh, success rate by just putting salt blocks out um, because it's just so important for the neural development of um, fetuses and babies. It's, it's incredibly important. And I think, uh, you know, we, we, again, we like to demonize salt, but <laughs> farmers are doing it. And also we learned our lesson too. Um, I think one of the first formula manufacturers uh, learned the lesson the really hard way because they left salt out of the formula and the babies that uh, consumed that formula ended up with um, neural developmental disorders and um, brain damage basically. So salt is really important for brain health as well, especially in growing children. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. I've, I've uh, tried all these different things over the years. Like I was using the blue bottle trace mineral research, you know, the little drops, I think it would add only like, you know, two to five per gallon because it's so concentrated. Um, mm -hmm. And then now I'm doing like by ocean Shen Blossom, like these little uh, purified seawater, there's multiple brands that like private label it, but these little purified seawater shots. So you get your potassium, your sodium, there's some magnesium in there, the trace minerals and kind of like a digestive boost because you need salt to have hydrochloric acid. Is that right? Or it helps with that? Oh, yeah. I think the parietal mm -hmm. cells grab it from the bloodstream. The parietal cells are in the stomach. They grab it from the bloodstream and help uh, use utilize it to create hydrochloric acid. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely really important. So minerals, if you have, you know, malabsorption issues or digestive issues too, likely there could be also a mineral component to that. Um, especially. <laughs> uh, so that's where the constipation comes in. It, you know, it helps kind of lubricate the system and get everything going from your migrating motor complex, but also just at the front of the line, which I like to think of the digestive system as like a, an assembly line. It's probably not the most accurate visual, but if something goes wrong up the chain, things are going to go wrong down the chain. It's kind of like a domino effect. Um, so yeah, if you know, malabsorption issues, digestive issues, feeling like you aren't digesting well, uh, heartburn, constant burping, um, that kind of stuff. That could be a sign that you need more chloride. That's awesome. Wow. Well, that's a pretty um, easy fix if someone just wants the shotgun approach. And uh, I mean, ideally, they get a HTMA from you, right? <laughs> yeah. HTMA can definitely help provide a, a more... Um, a bigger peek into how everything is working because some of the macro minerals are dependent on micro minerals, for example, like magnesium and boron. Um, 
boron assists with magnesium's absorption and or the regulation of magnesium. So, um, but yeah, salt shots, that's great. And that's all, actually also, I recently did a post on that um, salt in general uh, because it's been used as a, as a therapy for uh, preeclampsia, which is a really unfortunate um, thing to have while you're pregnant. It's high blood pressure, but also, you know, your liver starts to also <laughs> go down, um, which is really bad. And uh, it used to be called toxemia. Um, my mother had it. I think we talked about that actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she had it with. <laughs> your psychic. Someone asked. Someone asked about preeclampsia. Can minerals help? So you. you... <laughs> You oh, it. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. My mother had it um, with me and my youngest brother, and she actually had to deliver my youngest brother prematurely because of it, uh, because her blood pressure was so high. And unfortunately, the advice back then, which is really unbelievable to me, because there's been research that shows this since... <laughs> Since I think the 1800s, that salt helps with preeclampsia. So um, she avoided salt throughout her pregnancies. And I thank God I'm okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's just like it could have probably easily been solved if she had been just taking in more salt, maybe some additional protein, because um, that is also extremely helpful for uh, preeclampsia as well. And you have to make sure you have chloride in, in that case too. But, um, yeah, salt shots are a therapy, um, kind of a, a way to quell preeclampsia developed by Dr. Thomas Brewer, who was kind of the, he, he passed away now, but a, a lot of pregnant women utilize the, the Brewer diet and his approaches to, um, uh, dealing with preeclampsia. So uh, a, one of the things is a, a salt shot. And I think it's like three, three teaspoons of salt. And you just, hmm. with water mixed in, you just take it down. <laughs> <laughs> I love the taste of salt. Yeah. And I, it, is it, um, I think I heard Danny Roddy say recently, which I thought was interesting, like um, whole drink, like, you know, sugary milk, um, you know, before bed. And he's like, wow, I could taste the sugar like a lot. And then he said, like, in the morning, he'll have the same one. And it's not as strong. Like, there's not as strong of a sugary taste because his blood sugar, you know, he's he was fasting while he slept. Can is there kind of that same thing going on with salt where the more deficient you are, like, the flavor will change or any thoughts? On that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a hallmark of <laughs> adrenal stress. So if you crave salty foods, mm. your body needs salt <laughs> cravings are are i actually did a post on this this week too which is funny um uh cravings are just really an intelligent way the body works to get our attention and tell us that we need something and it, so you know if you're craving salty foods that's probably because you need more salt so generously salt your food don't hold back um if you're craving chocolate that could be a sign that you need magnesium. If you're craving coconut water, very easily potassium or bananas or, you know, anything like that, that has a lot of potassium. So the body is really smart. And uh, I, yes, it's very good at regulating itself too. So you'll know when <laughs> you kind of overdid it with salt because you'll just be like, Ugh. but usually people that need salt can just continuously consume salt and not even uh, flinch with the <laughs> the amount of salt they're eating. So I, I do think that it's very much so um, an intelligent design of the body. Mm. That's awesome. I think after this um, show, I'm going to do an experiment where I like double or triple my salt consumption to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely, I mean, I would love to know what happens. Tell me about it. <laughs> this this move. I mean, I hired movers, but I definitely burned through, through some minerals with this, this move. So. Yeah. I, I personally have been kind of doing that. Um, I've been kind of, I, I have eggs every morning and I've been sprinkling salt on my eggs, the crucial four salt. It's so yeah. good. Um, and I've just been putting more and more and more and more <laughs> every day to see like how much salt I can work up to without 
hating the taste. And um, I think I've found my sweet spot. So I, I definitely need salt though. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I did an HGMA myself recently and uh, I still have some work to do there, but it's always Mm -hmm. a journey. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's no secret. I'm like a huge coffee fan. (laughs) Like, (laughs) And I've done it in an unbalanced way, obviously like keto, you know, sugar-free, even, you know, vegetarian or vegan. And now where I'm, balancing my minerals, you know, I'm eating steak, I'm eating protein, I'm having, you know, carbohydrates. Um, I feel I, I'm still sensitive. Like if my system is dysregulated and I have a, you know, espresso, even with maple syrup, I'll feel my stress go up and I'm like, okay, I overdid it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But if I kind of support my system and I get good sleep and things are in place um, and I have coffee, then it's kind of a cool feedback like mechanism for me to kind of see where I'm at with the caffeine because so many times I'll drink it and I'm like, Oh wow. Like I don't get that like stimulation that people, you know, say coffee does. Mm-hmm. It's just, for me, it's just a boost with no crash. Um, if I support my system. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and it's the awareness that's really important. So I feel like most, most people go through life just like down in coffee, just not aware of how it's making them feel or even things in, most things in general, but, (laughs) um, it's that awareness, making the, the thing that you're doing and eating and consuming work for you rather than against you. I think that the awareness is the key to that. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, so I categorized the questions that listeners, uh, sent in. And, Mm -hmm. um, since we're on this topic, we might as well just start with sodium. Uh, so, um, someone asked about, um, is Redmond salt, real salt, a good source of important minerals? And um, it's funny, I just got some uh, like carnivore, like dehydrated, like liver. And, you know, the, a lot of brands are making those now, like dehydrated, like ribeye and sir- sirloin. And they use Redmond salt and I'm like, great. You know, I'm still going to eat it, but <laughs> it's, yeah. there's some excess iron in there, right? I mean, and the, if it's red and. Yeah, I mean, you know, when it comes to salt and choosing salt, it's important to prioritize what you want to stress out about and care about. So (laughs) um, I would say if you have other things that are higher on your priority list and, you know, that are more important that you need to put your energy towards, don't stress about the salt that you're eating, (laughs) especially if it's Redmond's because it's still way better than, uh, iodized table salt. (laughs) Or Himalayan, right? It's better than Himalayan. Yeah. Better than Himalayan for sure. Um, Himalayan too, you know, I think that uh, I've seen some like fake Himalayan salt now, which is so gross to me. (laughs) I, I think they're dyeing the salt pink to make it look like it's Himalayan, uh, which is, so just, you know, read your labels, I would say, if you do buy Himalayan, because um, you may just be getting table salt that's dyed pink, which is probably not, not good. (laughs) Um, But yeah, you know, uh, table salt, for example, it's, it gets a bad rap, Right. And we started iodizing our table salt in the 1920s, I think. And it was primarily in in a response to the goiter belt, I think, um, in Michigan. I may be getting that wrong. Um, (laughs) But in one of the states uh, up north in the center of America that has an M. (laughs) Sometimes my brain doesn't work. But um, Missouri. So. (laughs) <laughs> no, I think <laughs> Montana. Maybe. There's a lot of M's, yeah. <laughs> could be Montana. Could be Michigan. I'm not sure, but there's there's an area that was known as the goiter belt because I think somewhere like 40% of the population had goiters, which is not good. That kind of speaks to though um, how farming practices were affecting. Um, the mineral content and nutrient content in the food already so early on. Um, Cause back then before that there were no issues. So uh, the soil became iodine, very iodine poor and uh, people started developing goiters. So we decided, okay, let's start iodizing our salts. Um, 
And it's not the worst, uh, but there are anticoagulant agents in there. And usually those can consist of, uh, have traces of aluminum or cyanide. Uh, so, you know, it's not the best. And usually in the processing, uh, the other minerals are lost. Um, it's very mineral poor, except that it contains sodium, maybe some chloride. I'm not 100% sure on that. And then iodine. Um, whereas sea salt or, you know, rock salt uh, tends to have higher concentrations of all trace minerals or most trace minerals. Um, I did an analysis, uh, my own personal nerdy research, uh, like a year ago, maybe, on the different salts. And I think that actually Celtic sea salt had the most iron uh, by a long shot. Um, that said, by a long shot, you know, that means like 0.75 milligrams versus like 0.25 milligrams. Uh, so, you know, when, when we're looking at those kinds of things, it's not totally necessary to stress out about them because they're not providing so much nutrition for us anyway. Um, but if you are somebody that cares about it, um, I would say Celtic sea salt actually has quite a bit more, the most iron. And so I think that that somehow ends up unoxidized. So it's, it's gray. It has a gray tinge, um, maybe because of the other components in there and maybe because it comes from the sea. I'm not totally sure, to be honest. Uh, but Himalayan pink sea salt has, because it's mined from the earth, um, the, it, there's more potential to have heavy metals, heavy metal toxicity or traces of higher, higher levels of heavy metals like iron as well, which is the reason it's uh, pink is because it contains oxidized iron. Um, so Redmond sea salt, that I think actually comes from Utah. Um, and I thought it was mined in Utah. So now I'm thinking, why is it called sea salt? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I may need to brush up on this. Um, but it is, it's a very high quality sea salt. It, it, you know, it's family owned. I would trust them over a random company mining my Himalayan pink sea salt. Um, but, uh, you know, that said, it probably has some relatively higher traces of heavy metals as well. I can't confirm that 100%, but the color of the sea salt is kind of what you want to look for. Yes, colored sea salt may contain more minerals or, you know, other trace minerals, but um, Crucial 4 is actually my favorite one. And they have, I think their salt is like, oh gosh, is it 10 times more? magnesium then it was like four three to four times more or something yeah okay, that sounds more reasonable yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i really like theirs it's just so flaky so clean um and I, I trust their quality they're also a small business so i like to support small businesses where i can um going back to redmond's they are recommended by the root cause protocol so root cause protocol is all about copper and iron and you know, if they're recommending Redmond sea salts, like I think the benefit outweighs the risk. But again, you have to kind of think about what you want to stress out about. Uh, I wouldn't bank on getting all of your trace minerals from salt anyway. So kind of think about that when you're choosing salt. That was an awesome answer. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I love uh stores like TJ Maxx and, and Ross, but once you start seeing like pink Himalayan salt in their food section, I had someone say that's when they knew, you know, <laughs> they see that on the oh. shelves. Like, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> Gotta start yeah. questioning. <laughs> yeah. I always wonder where those, all that food comes from. Cause I, I used to shop there a lot. Uh, there, I don't think there's one near me anymore, but um, since I moved, but um, yeah, I always wonder like, are these all the expired ones or the defective ones? And <laughs> I wonder how old they are and it's, it's funny. <laughs> yep. Um, let's see. Someone asked is 1500 milligrams, the correct amount of sodium. And we had a lot of questions like what's the ideal amounts 
and times to take minerals. But that's Ooh. kind of an individual thing, right? Yeah, I would say what's more important is to pay attention to your cravings for salt. Um, so I, I'm not going to like I, – I never – go out and weigh or measure how much salt I'm taking in ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I literally cannot tell you how much salt I get every day. Um, but I think that when it comes to something like salt, it's really important to pay attention to your cravings for salt and to listen to those cravings and to understand its function and to support your body when you are in stressful situations in which you can also be depleted from uh, uh, in which sodium can be depleted from you. So exercise, um, you know, long conversations, uh, meetings, like, you know, for example, me, I had a very salty uh, snack before this because <laughs> I wanted something to fuel me. Um, I'm also going to give blood tomorrow and I need additional salt. Uh, you lose a gram of salt when you give blood. So it's really important to replenish. I think the recommended range I, and this is not something that I know off the top of my head, but I think it's somewhere around 1,000 to 1,500 um, milligrams. Uh, I don't think it's higher than that, but, you know, that's a pretty significant amount. So uh, it's important to make sure you're salting your food throughout the day uh, because salt can be really difficult to sort of catch up on, too. Uh, you don't want to have to, um, you know, go go throughout the day not eating any salt or any salt containing foods like pickles or seafood, for example. And then you get to the evening and you're like, oh, I feel like crap and I have to catch up on my salt. Let me dump like, <laughs> I don't know, four tablespoons of salt on my steak and that would just be unpleasant. So <laughs> good point. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd imagine too, the burn rate, like even whether it's protein or, you know, sugar or carbohydrate, like it's so individual, right? Like what might seem like a mega dose of salt in a day to one person might be like, mm -hmm. you know, just Necessary. barely meeting the needs of another. And yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. It totally depends on where you are and your healing stage as well. Um, and it's kind of like, um, what's a good analogy. It's kind of like putting water in a bathtub that's leaking or sorry, draining. So you kind of have to really try and build up the water in the bathtub um, and it, it can't just be here and there, like little drop. <laughs> um, so it depends how quickly the bathtub is draining. And that kind of, that's what I meant to, to point out there is kind of like looking at how quickly it is. Because if you have experienced a lot of stress, but you've slowed down, maybe you won't burn through it as much. But if you've experienced a lot of stress and there are non-negotiables, like you have to continue with this very stressful job, um, you are training for a marathon, whatever. Um, you have to continuously try really hard to replenish and you might need a lot more salt than the regular average person. Awesome. A um, few more questions on the sodium topic. Uh, is adding Malden sea salt to your water uh, ideal to retain that water instead of peeing it all out? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, salt can be one way to increase your mineral intake and Minerals are what keeps you hydrated. So yes, I would say that is one way, an effective way to keep yourself hydrated and from depleting more minerals. Because when you drink water, it's going to go right through you, but it's also probably going to take some minerals with it. Um, so, you know, salt is a very low hanging thing. People have salt most of the time in their house. So putting like a pinch, not where it's, you know, tasting like seawater, but <laughs> just a little bit so that you can support the retainment of the water and hydration of your cells rather than just continuing to deplete the cells. Um, but yeah, salt, uh, I like to also potentially add some juice or some lemon or citrus to it uh, that can increase it's nice for your stomach, but also it increases vitamin C. Um, it just has more components to give your body than none, um, as well as mineral drops. So mineral drops can be an excellent way to increase your overall mineral intake. Uh, and so that can also be another lovely way. But if you don't want to pay for minerals or if you don't have juice or, you know, 
it depends on your situation. Uh, salt is an excellent way to do that. Mm. I'm having flashbacks to my, my nutrition class in college. My teacher, uh, uh, it was like nutrition, you know, 100 or whatever. And she's mm -hmm. recommended the Gatorade, uh, you know, GU, GU, like, oh. <laughs> like oh, electrolyte things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But at least they were oh. getting their sodium and potassium, right? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I have to tell you, that is like, uh, it is such a lucrative market, those sports performance things. And mm. I, so I'm in Colorado and I go on hikes really often. I have a lot of mountain biker friends um, and they're constantly eating those things and using like this powder packs and, you know, granted it might keep them hydrated, you know, in some way, shape or form. Uh, it does a job, but um, ideally they're probably creating more imbalance at the end of the day. And if they just, you know, use real foods or real salts, uh, it'd probably be much more beneficial for their performance than um, these like chemical powders. <laughs> yeah. I just had a guy, he's building uh, our goat pen. And uh, yesterday we, we saw him and he was in his car, his truck crushing a rock star can and he just downed him. So Wow, people are still drinking Rockstar. Oh <laughs> man! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think those can be addicting, right? <laughs> yeah, I was on them for a good amount of time. Yeah, um, this is last question on sodium. It's really technical. I don't know why does sure. sodium bicarbonate <laughs> slow methanol poisoning? And I, I had to look it up. I guess methanol is like an alcohol they use to like extract stuff. Like it's in like window wash like windshield washer fluid and like brake fluid and antifreeze. Um, but I guess it's like a sodium channel blocker. So I haven't, I don't know if you've looked in the world, cause there's like calcium channel blockers. I guess there's like sodium channel blockers too. Huh. I, uh, I don't know where we would I get them though. <laughs> I don't think I can answer that question, but definitely very intrigued. I'll have to do, do some research after this. <laughs> it's a four, that's um, a Morley. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't tell you. I'm sorry, but uh, I'll, I'll definitely follow up. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much menthol we're getting exposed to. I mean, maybe like excipients and stuff. I don't know, but it looks like anti antidepressants and stuff like that. But um, Very interesting question. Oh, uh, antidepressants have it? That's what I'm seeing in this. Yeah. Poison control, California poison control article on it. Um, what about ADD medication? Um, let me do a search ADD. Yeah. I'm not seeing that. Um, okay. but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah. Just curious. Um, cause I know that certain medications can definitely impact minerals as well. Um, oh, that's one thing I should have mentioned when you asked me, <laughs> what are signs of mineral deficiency? Uh, yeah. Medications can really wreak havoc on minerals and vitamins, but, um, things like ADD medication, uh, can also just cause the stress reaction. Um, so you'll often see anyone taking ADD medication, which I have worked with adults that are on it. Um, their sodium and potassium are just like through the roof, being excreted very, very quickly. And um, it's, it's very interesting to see how a medication can impact somebody's mineral status. Um, but the sodium when bicarbonate. Oh, when you say through the, ro through the roof, you mean the ratios through the roof of those? Of well, yeah, it could depend, you know, on, again, the phase of stress. But mm -hmm. um, you will absolutely see, like, ex be it being excreted actively because the medication turns on that, um, the stress, um, the stress sim sim uh, system. It puts you in a sympathetic state. So... It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of medications uh, I've heard for years have like sodium fluoride, but also iron. I think I've heard that too. Yeah. Iron oxide. Birth control has iron oxide. It's used as a colorant. Uh, so anything like pinkish. And, you know, when you look at, or at least the pills that I were, was taking, <laughs> um, they were, they were, some of them were pink. Um, and so, and fluoride I think anything that starts with an F or flow, anything that's like a flow something uh, will definitely have fluoride. But I think fluoride is now in something like 
over 50% of medications. Uh, so they're just, I, I, and I, I couldn't tell you why. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty bad in how, how uh, pervasive this, <laughs> this poisonous metal is. Uh, actually, is it a metal? I'm not totally sure. Um, Hal halogen, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, that sounds, that sounds way more accurate. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but um, yeah. It, it's somehow in in uh, our medications and our water. Um, it's really interesting. It. Oh, oh go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Morley pointed me to this book called uh, Fluoride, the Devil's Poison, and it was actually written by a dentist. And it was written by this dentist whose patient challenged him to look at up fluoride and to understand the dangers of it because he was using it in his practice and wanted to use it on this patient. And um, then he started doing the research and then he ended up writing this book. <laughs> now he's completely against fluoride. Um, that's a really interesting book for sure. It's it's kind of disturbing though. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was going to ask you because if you saw me post like the fluoride, the aging factor, I haven't started it, but it looked like it came out in 1983. Um, oh, cover is kind of scary. It's like a woman; one half of her face is like aged. <laughs> so interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard of that book, but I'll look into it. I have a couple of things to look into after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you recommended to me. I read it earlier this year, "The Calcium Lie," which was good. And there's, it's interesting these books. Like I just got one um, that was, I think Morley, someone recommended it. Um, it was like really anti dairy. Uh, but it went into calcification. Mm. It was another calcium book. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like all these books have like a piece of the puzzle, but there are some things in them that are way off from what I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the Calcium Lie is an excellent book. I, I highly recommend that one. It's written by an, uh, an OBGYN actually, and he uses mm -hmm. hair tissue mineral analysis in his practice to help women uh, that get pregnant, but also recover from pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And um Yes, I do know that he is highly against dairy products. <laughs> um, but he, what he has to say is really, really interesting, you know, the other stuff. And he talks a lot about vitamins and how he, he actually has a section of vitamin C and how ascorbic acid isn't real vitamin C. And so he's, he's hip to that. And I think he's actually coming out with, so I've heard, uh, the vitamin C lie soon, which will be very cool. I'll look forward oh, to that. That is cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed that one. I, I recommend it, the cal uh, the calcium lie. And I like the part, I think it was near the beginning where, you know, a lot of people think uh, the bones are primarily made of calcium, but it's actually like mm -hmm. 12 minerals, right? Like there's yeah. like sodium in there and there's all these boron. and. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Uh, phosphorus, iron, um, fluoride is one of them. Um, magnesium uh what else but yeah uh oh selenium um sulfur and i think like chromium and then <laughs> uh, other trace minerals too it's but those are primarily what it's made of and then there's some trace minerals but yeah i mean it's it's in, very interesting how calcium has become this bone like um miracle <laughs> or at least they think so um, where we're totally missing out on um, other minerals. And so, yes, to go back to your first question, bone problems. Uh, we, I said teeth problems, but bone problems as well, uh, even though teeth are bones, um, can be a really big indicator of mineral imbalance. That's a good point. And, and the book I was trying to mention was um, Death by Calcium. I pulled it up by Thomas E. Levy, a, a, a cardiologist, and he's really against, you know, the regular intake of dairy, but against mm -hmm. calcium supplementation, which was the cool part. <laughs> and so yes. I just kind of started it, <clears throat> but I think it's a little more in depth than the calcium lie. Um, I mean, they kind of build on each other. I like them both, but yeah, death by calcium is pretty interesting. And I guess we can just jump into that mineral since we're already going that way. Um, sure. Would, would you say that it's kind of like the mismanagement of calcium? Because like people listen to me talking about calcification and they're like, oh, so I shouldn't have dairy. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> it's about the balance, right? <laughs> like 
magnesium and K2, and I think boron, there's like things that kind of conduct the symphony of calcium, right? Yes, totally, totally. Um, well, definitely the three you mentioned. So magnesium does it in three ways. It activates vitamin D, which works to liberate um, or absorb, cal increase the absorption of calcium from the intestines. Um, it also regulates the production and release of parathyroid hormone, which also works to liberate calcium from the bones for use. So usually that would be naturally in a natural state state uh, when parathyroid isn't being unnaturally uh, <laughs> um, uh, increased or produced. Um, usually it has to do with kind of balancing the alkalinity of the blood. Uh, so if our blood becomes too acidic, it will the body will use parathyroid hormone to release calcium from the, the bones to neutralize the blood and bring it back to a, a pH of, I believe it's seven. Um, so there's that part. Um, and then it stimulates calcitonin, which is a hormone that works to reduce blood calcium and opposes the effects of parathyroid hormone. So they're constantly, there's all these levers that need magnesium to function properly. And uh, a lot of people like to go directly for vitamin D, for example, but um, it's not that simple. <laughs> um, and so uh, what else did you say? You said vitamin K. Oh, yes, K2. That works to get calcium into the bones where it needs to go. So vitamin D helps absorb or increase the absorption of calcium in the intestines. But vitamin K2 helps get the vitamin uh, calcium into the bones where it needs to go. And then boron helps increase the uh, function of magnesium. And so kind of I, I was just creating a lesson on boron. So I'm having a little bit of blockage. Um, I, I, have, I have this course that I'm working on and um, I did a couple of slides on boron. So forgive me, but I think there was some research that I saw that said it helped fortify the bones as well. So that's really interesting too. And boron is very under understudied, I would say. Um, but definitely it has a component to it as well that it increases the half-life of estrogen um as well as one other hormone that i can't remember right now so it can actually help with hormonal balance too um but yeah these are all very important for calcium uh regulation and uh i would say of course vitamin d is the other one that gets <laughs> the fame. Uh, so that would probably be the fourth one, but we, we already talked about it and it increases um, calcium absorption from the intestines. But what's very interesting is that um, I, so I work in the preconception space a lot and um, a lot of pregnant women think that they have to supplement calcium. And what is so interesting and so intelligent of the body is that it increases the absorption of calcium by 50% while you're pregnant. So it is so incredibly important and so cool that the body does that just naturally. Um, so supplementation of calcium is actually not needed at all uh, during pregnancy. Um, and so I just, I think that that's so interesting. <laughs> that is fascinating. Wow. And what about outside of pregnancy? Like someone asked, is it worth taking a calcium supplement? Oh, <laughs> Um, so, you know, it depends on your doctor, <laughs> definitely talk to your doctor. Um, but in my experience, have, having been a HMA practitioner, I have never needed to ever give anyone a calcium supplement. Um, so it, it really is quite unnecessary. Usually we, we can get all the calcium we need. What's more, the problem is the other minerals and having worked those out. So a lot of times we'll usually see a calcium shell, for example, and that's just calcium not getting where it's supposed to be. They're probably K2 deficient. Maybe they're taking a vitamin D supplement. Um, and so, and they're also low in magnesium. Those are usually <laughs> very commonly uh, signs or, or things that are happening. And so uh, once we start to regulate the other things, the other minerals and, you know, kind of wean off the things that are causing problems like 
excessive vitamin D supplementation, then um, we can start to actually get calcium where it needs to go and it's never needed. Um, but I will say in uh, Dr. Thompson's calcium lie, he talks specifically about what happens when you supplement calcium. And when too much calcium is in the body, usually <laughs> because of supplementation, um, you get a magnesium deficiency because magnesium and calcium work together. And so that is not only going to cause a magnesium deficiency, but because those that's a ratio, it's actually a blood sugar ratio, you'll become naturally more insulin resistant right away. And so your bodies will not respond to insulin. Um, you will also have the suppression of the adrenal glands. So uh, your mag because your magnesium is probably being very depleted, your sodium is rising and it's very imbalanced at adrenal ratio. So you can't respond to stress as well as you could have uh, if you had more magnesium in your body. Um, you have the inhibition of the absorption of magnesium. So I think it's so funny that, um, so in, in the prenatal space, a lot of prenatals are iron free because they know calcium competes for absorption with iron. But what they forget is that calcium competes with magnesium and zinc and copper for absorption as well. So it's just kind of hysterical to me that they are focusing on this one thing. But um, anyway, it, it also competes with magnesium for absorption, but also these other minerals. And so you're probably going to become deficient or lose out on the opportunity to absorb these minerals because your body's uptaking so much calcium. Um, you have sodium loss, potassium loss, and when you lose potassium, you also lose the ability to um, regulate blood sugar because that's also a really important mineral for uh, blood uh, insulin sensitivity, um, as well as thyroid. So, <laughs> so the po uh, potassium and so uh, calcium ratio is the thyroid ratio. Too much calcium can indicate hypothyroidism. Too little uh, calcium can indicate uh, hyperthyroidism. So you have this hypothyroid, uh, almost forced hypothyroidism happening because also the cells are not responsive at all. <laughs> they become less responsive to insulin, but they also become less responsive to thyroid hormone too. So you have that, and then you have protein deficiency, probably because you have low stomach acid. Um, Calcium is a neutralizing, uh, I believe it's a very basic uh, mineral. Um, so you also have sodium pump failure. <laughs> um, uh, I already mentioned insulin, thyroid, um, and then your overall metabolism slows. So high calcium is going to contribute to an overall slower metabolism just because literally hormones cannot communicate as well as they used to. And you're also depleting yourself of other minerals that are super important for the overall function of the metabolism. Uh, the metabolism runs on minerals. It doesn't run on anything else. So um, I would say that is a problem. And then you have iron overload potentially. Um, so you don't have magnesium, which is really important for iron regulation. You're losing out on copper. Um, you're over you're slowing down the metabolism um, and it's going to potentially cause iron overload as well. Wow. There's a lot of uh, dots to connect here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> in short, supplementing, especially, you know, something like calcium in a mega dose is probably not a good idea. I would focus on whole food sources of that, such as dairy, which is the best source. And then um, you could do, I mean, you could do some greens, but those have high oxalate content, which also deplete magnesium and cal uh, calcium in, if they're not properly taken care of. So um, you could do bone broth. You could do fish with bones like sardines or anchovies. You could do, um, you could potentially do pearl powder or uh, eggshell calcium. Uh, I will say those are, in addition to the bones uh, that you consume, uh, those are usually calcium carbonate, which is not as well absorbed. Uh, I know it's really popular in the Ray Peak community, but um, 
calcium carbonate is not the best form of calcium. So I think it's something like 11 steps to get it to be calcium bicarbonate. So mm -hmm. calcium lactate is the, actually the form of cal supplemental calcium that is the best absorbed that I've seen work. Um, but calcium carbonate in the form of pearl powder and uh, what's it called? Eggshell calcium can still be a nice way to increase supplemental calcium or via whole foods. Um, especially if you're dairy intolerant. That's awesome. Yeah. You just knocked out two questions right there with that answer. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, let me see. Yeah. So someone asked, how can I start incorporating dairy again? I think we might've talked about that in previous shows, but it's kind of like a go slow thing, right? Like add it in slowly, just like half a cup a day and slowly increase kind of thing or. Yeah, potentially. So it really depends where you're coming from. If you're somebody that has definitive like digestive problems, we probably want to get those digestive problems, uh, support them and support the digestive system a little more before we try to jump into dairy, because likely uh, we are not going to be able to produce enough lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down lactose, um, the dairy sugar <laughs> in the dairy. Uh, and that's usually what people have the most issues with. So, you know, small, the small intestine is really important for creating that enzyme. And if we have a lot of irritation in there, even lower down in the colon, it can kind of likely there could be some bacterial overgrowth or um, some irritation of the microvilli. So it's really important to kind of, uh, take care of those and support that and really support the digestive system and make sure your, your digestion is really good before you try to jump into dairy and, you know, also make sure that you're feeling really good. Um, cause that'll give you the best chance at making it work, I think. Um, and I've, I've done this with my clients and, um, I was actually just talking about this with somebody and she was like, I, I never literally, literally last year I couldn't digest dairy this year. I can, it's awesome. And now she's eating tons of dairy and she's pregnant too. So it's really great because she's getting vitamin A, calcium and a ton of other minerals. So uh, I would say assess your digestive capacity first and then yes, you can start incorporating dairy. I would go for lower lactose foods like, um, Parmesan cheese, for example, that's pretty low lactose, like the hard cheeses. Start with those, see how you react. Maybe have some every day, build it up, and then you can move on to higher lactose foods. I think milk is probably the highest lactose food. Um, don't quote me on that, but <laughs> do you know, Matt? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's, I, I think maybe the breed too. I think. It's my understanding like cow like bovine milk, cow's milk has more lactose than like goat's milk. I mm -hmm. I, I believe that's part part of it. Um or it's Oh yeah, more, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And experiment too with cow's milk versus like A1 versus A2 mm -hmm. um dairy sources because that could also be potentially one of the drivers of the intolerance. It's the animal that it's coming from as well. So don't be too disappointed if cow's milk doesn't work for you or cow's milk products don't work for you. There's always goat's milk, sheep's milk stuff that you can try out and experiment with. Um, but yeah, definitely start with lower lactose things and then move on up and, you know, have like a little bit of dairy every day until you're able to increase the amount and quantity and volume. And hopefully you'll be in a place where you can just enjoy it freely without any issues. I love it. Um, yeah. And the, the, we just started giving our, our sand and goats uh, free minerals like several months ago. And I noticed a difference in how the milk tastes and how it's absorbed. So even the little oh, things nice. down to like their food and water and what they're supplemented with, there's so many variables I think that affect the product, of, you know, the milk. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, totally. It's <laughs> what they eat is what we get. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, let's jump into, uh, we just have a few on potassium and you've touched on it a little bit. Um, only a few questions here. Uh, the first one is pretty good. Is potassium a key fighter in preventing diabetes? Um, you know, that's a really great question. I would say 
there's multiple factors in preventing diabetes. Uh, potassium, because of its just importance in uh, blood sugar regulation, so it, it acts like insulin. Um, and that's why fructose can, or fruits can be such a great uh, way to kind of, or thing to incorporate, I guess, if you have blood sugar issues is because of its their potassium content. Um, and they kind of act like insulin, so they require less of a, potassium can act like insulin, so therefore your body requires less of an insulin response. Um, I believe it also assists with the storage of glycogen. So it supports the liver in that sense. And when we are unable to store glycogen, and when we are releasing high amounts of quantity, uh, high quantities of um, insulin, hyperinsulinemia, that's when we can get into problems and chronically that'll become an issue. So I would say it's, it could be one of the most important things. It's not like the factor, <laughs> I would say. Um, it, it'd be difficult to, to put that much on potassium. Uh, but I would say if you do have blood sugar issues, it is likely that you have potassium issues or deficiency. So um, that's something that you probably want to incorporate and see how your body is doing because it'll improve your insulin sensitivity, not to mention your thyroid uh, your your cells sensitivity to thyroid hormone as well. Mm. That's awesome. I'll never forget uh, Adam Bergstrom. I think he always says this. He, he references a woman that did a, I think it was a week long Hagen Dazs fast to cure her candida. <laughs> wow. So she just ate Hagen Dazs the whole week? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe wow. it was a month. It was like a week to a month. Yeah. <laughs> That goes against all the anti-sugar <laughs> candida uh, cures, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> sounds like the best kind of fast, but. Um, yeah. Sign me <laughs> up. <someone> at... <laughs> <laughs> I still like Double Rainbow. That's a good brand. San Francisco vanilla ice cream is pretty, pretty good. Oh, um, awesome. I, yeah. I haven't come across that. I, I try to buy Strauss. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a pretty good milk brand. They don't they don't um, send their milk here, but they definitely sell their ice cream here. <laughs> Easy to transport, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, someone asked the second question on potassium. They're having paradoxical reactions to <clears throat> potassium, and I don't know. They didn't clarify, you know, food source or I'm guessing supplemental source. But they said edemia ileus, which I had to look up. I guess that's inability of the bowel to contract normally <laughs> and mm. exhaustion. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's kind of a, a, you know, broad kind of a ambiguous question. Um, but I'm guessing with supplementing potassium, it could be a little, a little dangerous depending on the form. And uh, yeah. Did they uh, say that they are supplementing it? No, they just said potassium. Um, and have you heard like is it potassium chloride that's used in the lethal injection? I believe it was Yeah. That <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um I don't know if it's so different orally probably. But. <laughs> well, potassium is really really important, but it does have the ability to stop the heart. So that's why you you won't ever see uh, supplements over like 200 milligrams or something like that. Uh it's because they don't want people potentially causing a heart attack. That said, I think that they grossly underestimate the amount of potassium that people need. Um, so <laughs> uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that scare anybody. Um, if they're experiencing paradoxical reactions. So my question would be one, did you get an HTMA or did you just start, you know, increasing your potassium willy nilly without any guidance? Um, that's really important to understand not only because it's important to understand potassium, but also what is your sodium level? Because if it's if you're experiencing edema uh, by consuming more potassium, you might be outweighing your sodium levels, or you know, are you increasing your sodium much higher than your potassium, even though you're increasing your potassium? There, it sounds like there could be other mineral imbalances that uh, are happening uh, and that are not being taken care of. And if you're just focusing on the potassium, that could be the issue. There's also the question of how 
fast did you increase your potassium? Because <laughs> if you increased your potassium really quickly, that could also potentially be an issue. Uh, you know, you don't want to go from zero to a hundred, uh, especially with potassium. Uh, you know, I've I myself <laughs> cannot handle cream of tartar, which is one of the most rich sources of potassium, because it literally makes me go to the bathroom every time, no matter what. Um, so, and that's just a sign of how depleted I am, and how almost metabolic this potassium becomes. Um, so, I would say, you know, and that's a sign for anybody that drinks coconut water that's experiencing digestive distress or, <laughs> or aloe, usually aloe juice, the diarrhea, yes, it does have natural laxatives, but it has really high in potassium. And so if somebody's really depleted and they just kind of just do like a potassium bomb, um, that can cause a lot of problems. So I, I would say I, I can't really provide any guidance per se, but I would probably encourage this person to work with an HTMA practitioner so that they don't make their issues work worse. Um, or, you know, go see a doctor right away. because <laughs> It sounds like if edema is happening, uh, that's not good. Um, but likely the doctor will say, oh, let's decrease your potassium or, you know, limit your sodium, blah, blah, blah. So uh, take what I say at face value and uh, decide who you want to work with and do more, uh, I guess, research on with on about this. Yeah, we actually had a question, which one is best, coconut water or aloe vera juice? And I didn't know, so aloe is a good source of potassium, like similar to coconut? Oh, yeah, it's, it's mm. like uh, 900 plus milligrams of potassium in a serving. So it's crazy high in potassium. Um, it also has laxatives, so they're called anthraquinones. And these are also, it, it's natural latex as well, um, which is very interesting. So if somebody has a latex issue or a latex allergy, usually they're encouraged to stay away from things like aloe or anthraquinones. Um, but yeah, aloe juice has a ton of potassium. Uh, what you want to get, though, is the inner leaf, not the outer leaf, because it the outer leaf, or sorry, the inner leaf, not the whole leaf aloe juice, because the whole leaf will contain the outer leaf, and that's what contains the anthraquinones or the laxatives. Um, but as to to answer the question, which one's better, I would say it depends on what works for you better and what you can be the most consistent with. Because if you hate the taste of aloe juice, which it's not like that bad, uh, I like <laughs> a lot of people ask me, oh, what does it taste like? Uh, it's just like watery tea to me, like yeah, yeah, a yeah. watery tea. So, okay, I'm glad you agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know how accurate that's. I'm not that great at describing the flavors. Um, but yeah, it tastes like watery tea. And so I add some juice to it, whether that's tart cherry juice or orange juice. But I, and, and it is, you know, more expensive too than coconut water. So it really, I, I get aloe juice as like a treat for myself. Um, whereas like I will most likely be drinking coconut water every day versus aloe juice, but, um, they're both really great options. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it during the summer. Um, mm -hmm. I actually interviewed Michael Haley of, uh, he has like Stockton aloe. It's like the inner leaf, like raw and filtered. They like ship like frozen gallons to you and then you just Whoa. thaw it out. And, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be beneficial for a lot of different conditions. I think even some mm -hmm. cancers, like colon cancers and things. So. Yeah, definitely. It's digestively very supportive. Um, that's very cool. I'll have to check that out because I was trying to figure out how to uh, get aloe juice in a more affordable and bulk way. So that's great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you inspired me. I have to get back into that this summer because when it's hot out, that aloe drink is really so soothing, good cooling. yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. um so last last category here to cover is magnesium and okay. uh, i think you already touched on a few of these um let's see oh so this is a good one so you said going to the bathroom is a sign of deficiency because someone said magnesium bicarbonate in even small amounts gives me digestive issues. Um, mm -hmm. Is that just a building tolerance issue? They asked, like, 
Should they just go slow and keep on it? That's a good question. If you know, you're going to the bathroom every time you take magnesium bicarbonate, no matter how much, I would probably try a different form of magnesium. Um, because while yes, it's a great, excellent form of magnesium, there are so many other forms. I think there's like 40 something. <laughs> um, and uh, well, you know, the ones that you can get it as supplements, um, there's, a, I guess, like maybe a dozen or so. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't force this, especially if you have digestive distress. That's just going to not be good. <laughs> um, it's your body telling you to stop. So I would, I would maybe put that on the back burner and come back to it once you've tried a couple of other forms. Uh, and I would say the forms that I would recommend are probably glycinate or bisglycinate. Um, let's see. I am totally, oh, malate. Malate. Uh, and malate can be a little bit more energizing. So I would try that in the morning or during the day, like maybe before noon, no later than three, if you're going to take that, uh, because it can be stimulating uh, versus glycinate, which you can take throughout the day. I like to take it at night because I find it relaxing. And uh, three and eight, which could work. Uh, I think it's a little bit more expensive because I believe it's patented. Uh, do you do you know hey, about three? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, and they, yeah, they advertise it as like the only form that could cross the blood-brain barrier, and uh, oh, I've heard that's BS. Yeah, they God. all do. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would agree with you one hundred percent. Oh gosh. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I would probably avoid that just on principle, <laughs> um, uh, and you could probably save yourself a lot, a lot of money. Um, but yeah, so glycinate, malate, and then the chloride, which is great. So chloride, usually you take transdermally. So transdermally means through the skin and you could do uh, Epsom salt baths or magnesium chloride flake baths or uh, magnesium oil spray or magnesium oil lotion, and that will all be chloride. And so that's a really nice way to get magnesium as well. And so if you're experiencing digestive distress with bicarbonate, potentially I would start low and slow with these. Uh, even with just a topical to see how you react and then potentially add in an internal supplement um, very slowly. But try and play around with the forms, see what works for you, um, you know, also what you can afford because it's, it's fun to have all these options, but it can add up. So um, pick one and start there and then, you know, play around with it. Would you say if someone lives um, on a beach, like you're near a beach that just going in the ocean for like a half hour to an hour a day, I guess that's kind of a luxury for most people with jobs, but uh, that's a way to get magnesium too, right? Totally. Yeah. There's so much magnesium in the ocean. Um, that, that, that is an excellent point. So if you live, if you live near, uh, the ocean, like that's a free foot bath right there or a free, a free magnesium bath. Um, definitely a wonderful way to get magnesium. Mm. And someone asked which forms to avoid. Um, would it be like oxide, carbonate? Like, I don't know, orotate. I haven't heard much on orotate. Um, <laughs> ooh, yeah. I can't recall exactly right now. But, um, oh, well, definitely oxide. Avoid that. Um, you're not going to absorb much of that at all. And uh, citrate. Uh, mm. Those can be the most irritating. Also, the citrate molecule can potentially have copper implications. Um, let's see. Orotate, I I think it's not as good. And there's one more. Um, oh, gosh. Maybe it's sterate or... No, that's not. That's a filler. Uh, there's one more that I'm not thinking of, but it's also not great. Um, so I would, I would go for the ones that I mentioned, malate, glycinate, chloride, and three and eight, if you really want <laughs> and bicarbonate <laughs> as well, if you can handle it. Um, that's also an excellent option. Uh, but the rest are kind of like, I I've just found more success with these few and they work and they're excellent and usually, uh, very effective. 
Oh, there's magnesium lactate. It's like bound with lactic acid. That's probably not good. <laughs> oh, yeah. I would consider, you know, uh, if you have any blood sugar issues or anything like that, you probably don't want to take that, um, especially in high doses. So, yeah, that's interesting. Um, let's see. Should you balance magnesium supplementation with sodium and potassium from food? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, so kind of like what we talked about before, it, it depends on, you know, if you're a fast oxidizer, slow oxidizer, kind of where you fall, how much this could impact you. But yes, this is often why people feel so crappy uh, when they take magnesium. And I'm not saying all people feel this way. I'm just saying the those that do feel crappy when they take magnesium, it's like, the couple, maybe one out of 10 people. Um, but it's because of that reason that they're overdoing it on the magnesium and not supporting their sodium and potassium. And all of these minerals work in ratios. So it's really important to make sure you're getting all of these nutrients rather than just focusing on one. And so if you start to feel crappy, you kind of know, okay, I need to really up my sodium and potassium. And sometimes I just have clients only focus on sodium and potassium because it is just so critical and they're so low that any bit of magnesium is going to be kind of almost a stress until they can handle it. Wow. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Um, is magnesium safe during pregnancy? <laughs> so always ask your doctor <laughs> about the safety of supplements. Um, for the most part, I I like it. I think it's extremely helpful. It's it's very important for pregnancy. It has many many functions. It's one of the top two minerals that is in high, highest amounts in amniotic fluid, and that's the fluid that the baby is constantly swallowing. So you can imagine how important that is. It's next to copper, which is the second important most important mineral or the highest in highest concentrations in the amniotic fluid. So that itself kind of nods to how important it is for the baby and the overall health of the baby and pregnancy in general. Um, it's also important, it can play a role in preventing preeclampsia as well. So, you know, salt is definitely a huge for preeclampsia protein for sure, but also um, uh, magnesium as well. Uh, gestational diabetes is higher, um, I guess you're at higher risk to get gestational diabetes in a magnesium deficient state, um, morning sickness, uh, parathyroid dysfunction as well, because uh, remember magnesium runs parathyroid hormone, um, placental insufficiency. Uh, so it's really important for the placenta. Uh, you're more likely at risk for low birth weight or miscarriage, high blood pressure, uh, blood cramps, all the things that come with mineral imbalance. So magnesium is really important. And unless you're making like mineral broths throughout pregnancy or drinking tons of bone broth, likely you will need to supplement at some point in some way, shape or form. And I should note that prenatals, prenatal vitamins, they usually are very, um, well, so prenatal vitamins, you know, they have everything you quote unquote need, um, <laughs> which is not true. Uh, but they have to make money off of this supplement. And so usually what I've found is they cut corners with the minerals. And so they're giving you maybe 100 milligrams of magnesium oxide. And that is not enough. So um, I would say a supplement is probably a good idea. Just talk to your doctor to make sure that it's okay for you as an individual and um, maybe look into the forms of magnesium that I just mentioned earlier. That's awesome. Um, and you said magnesium runs parathyroid hormone, uh, abbreviated, abbreviated PTH. And this has been an interesting, like ongoing debate. Uh, Cause I had Jim Stevenson jr. That runs like the Facebook group, psychosteroid mm -hmm. hormone D. And yeah. uh, I just had him on my show for the second time. And, it's interesting because like the metabolic health or Ray Peak community really like hones in on like D3 supplementation you need to regulate PTH to keep it from getting too high. 
but that just sounds so simplistic um, because there are other, it's not the only control. It's like a control axis and magnesium is a part of that axis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely a very interesting topic. I think it's very complicated too. Uh, but, you know, I think D3 supplementation is a top down approach, whereas uh, making sure the body's metabolically sound with the proper new minerals and nutrients to support PTH is a more root cause approach, I would say. Um, you know, if someone's really suffering, perhaps there is a time and a place for that. But uh, it's almost allopathic in a sense to think about it that way to, oh, PTH is high here. D3 supplement. Uh, that's not solving the root cause of the issue, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a lot of interesting nuggets I got from that. He said, Jim said, any food that contains D3 also contains 25 OHD, which is interesting. I thought foods only have one form of D, but they, I guess they have multiple forms. So that's that is very cool. Right? <laughs> I didn't catch that. I, I know that if you put a food in the sun, it will increase the D amount that it contains, which is so mind blowing to me. Um, <laughs> it's, an, it's another reason to have like barbecues outside everybody. Uh, <laughs> but um, that is very cool that it contains 125. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I still need to set up my UV light that he got me all jacked up, interested in, in Lumisterol L3 like that. Cause I guess it's its own substrate that creates its own set of, its own class of molecules that's mm -hmm. totally different from D3. So <laughs> Yeah, it is so interesting. Every time I dive into D vitamin D again, it's and I have a, a, a lesson that dives into this in my upcoming course, which just like has been so complicated to try to <laughs> try to write. But um every time you you look at like the pathways chart, it is just mind blowing how many different pathways can occur and that are that exist and it's just so cool and i think we we really like to um uh i don't know i think it's we like to simplify it which is good um but i think it's more complicated than that mm -hmm. uh so some finishing questions um someone asked uh supplementing with iodine and selenium do you ever recommend that mm -hmm. Great questions. Um, other minerals. Uh, yeah. So I have never come across anyone that I've needed to supplement iodine or selenium. <laughs> um, and iodine supplementation can be tricky. Um, it has the potential to cause hypothyroidism. So <laughs> self-induced hypothyroidism, hypothyroid symptoms. Uh, so it's really one of those minerals that requires a very precise uh, hand and you it's very difficult to get that clarity for the precision that you need um, so I usually don't recommend supplementing iodine uh, I've never needed to with anyone that I work with um, I will always recommend food first because the body will always know what to do with it it's kind of like iron in a way that like I would only recommend food sources of iron. It's not quite as <laughs> destructive as iron, um, but you know, it's it's really really important to get from foods because the foods will also contain other nutrients like zinc and selenium um, that are also super supportive of the other the symptom the the systems excuse me uh, that iodine is so supportive too. Uh, that said, iodine is incredibly important for overall health, thyroid health and metabolism. It's also really important for neurological development of the baby. If you are, you know, looking to reproduce anytime soon. Um, so I think that that's important. Uh, it's really interesting because there are doctors out there that say that, yes, everyone should be on iodine. And then there are other doctors out there that no, people should not be even eating, you know, iodine rich foods because the, the food system is um, fortified with iodine and it's just like we have to have a happy medium somewhere. And I would say food is always the best source of iodine because um, your body will know what to do with it. It can excrete any excess and 
um, it's it's very supportive. Uh, so that is my long-winded answer. <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot Selenium. Um, so Selenium, uh, I I don't I I probably wouldn't recommend it. I think there is one there's an imbalance that it could potentially create and I'm not my brain is not recalling it right now um I do know that vitamin E is a seleno enzyme uh which so that's pretty cool um so when you get it's, vitamin E oh go ahead it's connected with silver too I don't know if you looked into that but <laughs> oh that's interesting um maybe I have heard that maybe I didn't research it more um but yeah I think there, there potentially might be an access somewhere that if you supplement it, there could be an imbalance that's created. Um, I'm really blanking right now, but <laughs> it's also not one of the ones that I recommend supplementing uh, just because food is just so much more effective. And um, it's, it's also, so selenium, funnily enough, it wasn't really considered, it used to be considered a toxic element until the 70s or 80s and that's only when we realize its essentialness so prior to that everyone was like let's stay away from selenium it's poison <laughs> um and only until recently which is about 40 years or maybe 50 that's really not a long time that we've started to understand selenium's importance um so that said i'm also cautious with supplementation because of that, because I do believe selenium toxicity is very possible. Um, so again, food first always is my motto. Uh, seafood is probably the one of the best sources as well as dairy. Uh, dairy has a lot of selenium as well. So those are two great sources for you. That was awesome. Yeah, it, since I come from the detox world, uh, it's really trendy and it has been for years to like supplement iodine either orally or on the skin, like Lugol's or something or nascent uh, to push out the other halogens like chlorine, bromine and fluoride. It just seems like, you know, you're, you're like one step forward, two steps back. Like it's not really solving the issue and it's potentially causing many more issues. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a very interesting approach to that. Um, but I don't know. I, I singular supplementation. So I like singular supplementation, but I also don't like singular supplementation for that reason of specific nutrients. Um, so caveat there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, well, awesome, Lauren. I think we covered a lot of ground here and uh, gave a lot of practical <clears throat> um, info. Um, oh, I forgot to ask you, potatoes, a lot of people don't realize those are a great source of potassium, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Especially if you include the skins, um, if you can handle the skins, you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, they're, they're an excellent source of potassium. Um, and yeah, if you, you're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of nutrients, I think some B vitamins, some vitamin C as well. So potatoes are actually nutrient powerhouses. Yeah. Adam Bergstrom, I think is like on a potato diet pretty much. <laughs> It's, oh it's yeah. Like, like, yeah. Yeah. Potatoes, um, coffee. It's really, <laughs> um, I mean, it sounds delicious. <laughs> I would probably get a little bored. <laughs> right. <laughs> and butter. Yeah. That's interesting about the skins though. I made a post, I think it was last year or something on why I avoid the potato skins, but, um, it, it like some people could handle it. Right. Is it, is it, does it have to do with your state of metabolism, your metabolic rate or. I'm not sure, to be honest. Mm. Um, I think that the skins could potentially be irritating to the digestive tract more so than the mm. metabolism, uh, than, than the effect that it could have on the metabolism. Um, mm. I think it's more of a digestive issue because they're, they're tough and they contain anti-nutrients or some kind of anti-nutrient. Um, so it's, it's saponins, right? Or am I getting that wrong? I think so. Yeah. And I, I guess my theory, maybe it was, maybe it's wrong that <laughs> kind of like the outer skin is going to have the most, you know, toxicity, whether that's glyphosate or heavy metals yeah. you know, floating around or whatever, you know, yeah, um, kind of like peeling the carrot kind of idea. I don't know. That was. 
Oh, I mean, <laughs> you know, to backtrack, I don't think saponins are anti-nutrients, but they are toxins. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, that said, I don't know, this whole e e D EWG, like clean 15, um, dirty dozen, the glyphosate is getting incorporated into the food. Mm. So I feel like that we can only take those lists with so much uh, credibility. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, I you know, I I don't I I don't think the skins would have any more or less potentially because they're grown in the ground too. But uh, I do think the toxins could potentially be irritating. I mean, that's what they're there for is to <laughs> is to ward off um, any potential pr uh, predators. <laughs> so. It's it's a very interesting question though. I, I definitely would love to research more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to get our geodesic dome going, and because I was originally the plan was grow like root vegetables up here, which is easy, you know, beets, carrots, potatoes. But now the whole world's opened up, so I'll probably be growing mangoes. Who knows? <laughs> Ooh, yes, those are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <my too. laughs> yeah. Right now I'm getting them unripe from Mexico, so it's quite a ways to, to get up here. Do you think you can grow a coconut tree? That would be awesome. Yeah, I was actually, that was one of my first jobs in the health industry was Costco demoing those little pink coconut water, raw coconut water shots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, stay tuned. But uh, <laughs> That would be awesome. More to the MitoLife Black Label right <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um but yeah thanks lord it's always fun talking with you and we'll have to do it again maybe on the other minerals next time and uh yeah thanks again for coming on the show oh thanks again for having me uh great questions i'm really always impressed by everyone and um it's always a really fun time to chat with you so thanks again for having me awesome we'll stick around as i close out the show thanks lord <laughs> That wraps up today's show. I hope you guys got a lot out of that. I'm definitely inspired to increase my salt consumption and I already feel the beneficial effects of doing so. Just basically doubling it, what I was consuming before. It's such an easy, uh, cheap thing, especially if you're just putting salt directly in your mouth or salting your food a little bit extra. I really love the Bi Ocean uh, shots. Uh, Shen Blossom sells them and they're kind of a fun way to get your salt in but if for whatever reason that's a little out of your uh, budget then you could definitely just salt your food extra liberally and see how you feel uh, doing that but the uh, marine plasma basically it's uh, purified seawater I like doing that and the Shilaji and I believe that I'm getting the best of both worlds, minerals from the ocean and then minerals from the land. Uh, While well, there are some marine uh, minerals in there, marine source minerals and shilajit, uh, I definitely feel the uh, balancing effect of combining both of those. Uh, the purified uh, panacea shilajit resin tablets from MitoLife with the uh, bio-ocean pure marine plasma shots. I've gotten a lot of questions about body odor and the cause of body odor and like an ammonia kind of smell. And our liver has this thing called the ammonia cycle that it can kind of get stuck in. I believe it's primarily caused by lipofuscin and omega-3 fats complexing with iron. And that definitely is a primary cause of fatty liver disease. But there's also this sodium connection with uh, aldosterone. And when people think of the adrenal glands, they'll often go right to adrenaline right? Adrenals, adrenaline, but actually aldosterone is the primary steroid hormone that's produced by the adrenal gland. And it causes a lot of effects. It will actually cause potassium loss and it will increase the conversion of protein into ammonia, which can create that smell, that, that body odor effect. And what's really interesting is progesterone, can lower it, but also just increasing your salt intake will lower aldosterone. 
And by lowering aldosterone, you'll actually preserve your potassium and magnesium. And that causes a cascade of effects because you're affecting three minerals right there. Sodium, which as Lauren mentioned, aldosterone retains sodium in the body. So you're affecting sodium, but you're also affecting potassium and magnesium. That's three out of the four macro minerals just by the salt trick, just by increasing your salt. That's why I'm so blown away by it. And the salt-free uh, fad is really interesting. And anything that increases stress, uh, the keto diet, the intermittent fasting diet, the raw primal diet, the carnivore diet, any fad extreme diet will increase stress. And again, this isn't just adrenaline, it's increasing aldosterone. And that's why, as Lauren said, these <laughs> mineral supplements are now trending right now in the carnivore diet community because they need it <laughs> because they're stressed because their adrenals are stressed because they're not consuming carbs sugar glucose the primary fuel of the body forcing the body into a backup system and that has tremendous effects on your mineral status so when you try to cheat the system not consume sugar you can, that's synonymous with carbs then you will inevitably throw your minerals out of whack, especially if you're not uh, taking in supplemental powders, which is definitely required, I'd say, for most people, you know, eating ideally or not. Uh, just to come back into balance, I don't believe that it's possible solely through food. Now, do we have to do it forever? Well, depends. If you transition over time, like I've done, try to get lower and lower stress loads. Uh, I don't have any more light pollution or noise pollution here on the off-grid uh, home that I just moved to and super grateful for that. And that definitely affects my mineral, mineral status. It affects my magnesium burn rate and the burn rate of all of my nutrients. So I really enjoyed this one. Uh, the connections that could be made are really endless the inner relationship between fat soluble vitamins, minerals, enzymes, hormones. It's really important to look at the whole picture. And where I've been having fun looking at is the supplemental D, uh, secosteroid D3 supplementation, and seeing how that can increase calcium absorption and how that's often not a good thing if someone's not drinking filtered water. Uh, like up here in Idaho, everyone's on well water, everyone's breaking down. I see it. They're stiff. They're turning into rocks, basically. They're, they're turning into uh, inflexible rocks. And that comes from the excess iron in the water and the excess calcium. So calcium deficiency, in my opinion, very rare. It's kind of impossible because the calcium's coming in from everywhere. Uh, if we just say drinking and bathing water, it's really the magnesium that people need from what I've seen speaking with clients and talking with practitioners that work with clients. It's often that magnesium that needs to be uh, kind of mega dosed uh, for quite a while. And the forms, again, there's no best form. You have to experiment to find what works for you. And for a lot of people, it will be the transdermal form, but the pill form might work too. You know, powdered pilled synthetic magnesium could work. Uh, as Lauren said, I would just avoid the oxide, oxide the citrate, uh, the cheaper ones you'd find in like a CVS store. So I'll put the links below uh, to Lauren's uh, website. Uh, it's just innate-nutrition.com. And from there, you can find her uh, posts on Instagram, her blogs. Uh, she does lab analysis of hair tissue mineral analysis, which I should probably do. I've actually never done that and the full Monty iron panel, which is the test that I recommend uh, everyone get because it's the best picture. It's way better than all those cheaper labs that you can do where they're looking at the wrong markers and it just confuses you more. Uh, I'm kind of anti labs for the most part because I think that people kind of get caught up with them and they make things extra complex where I said at the beginning, you could just be salt deficient or maybe copper deficient because you're not doing beef liver or oysters or shilajit. Uh, I would try to start simple and make it more complex as you go, but don't start complex unless that's fun for you. Like it is for me. 
I love complexity. It's fun for me, but for a lot of people, it's stressful and it's just an unnecessary layer to deal with. So start simple and then slowly increase the complexity until you see results is the way that I would do it. So we're still getting set up here at the new homestead, fully off grid, just on solar and propane. There's no electricity coming up here. So I haven't been too active uh, either on the academy or on social media or anything like that. Still unpack unpacking boxes and uh, working on learning how to fish. We just harvested a bunch of morel mushrooms and had that with steak. That was really good. Working on getting more wild food in the diet and just becoming uh, more sustainable. Uh, but if you go to my website, matt-blackburn.com, the latest product I added there was my uh, espresso machine that I use every day, the Breville. It's very affordable, very easy to use. I think this is my second or third one, and I haven't had any issues with it. It's really awesome. And whenever I do a show like this, I always mix in uh, heavy organic cream, maple syrup, uh, Alpha Dynamics, either the Lion's Mane or today I'm doing Cordyceps, which increases ATP production. It's more of an energy boost with the Cordyceps and Shield Jeep Powder. And that's my little elixir. But usually in the day, I'll have uh, espresso shots with a little bit of maple syrup in there. And it kind of sits at the bottom, so you kind of have to shoot it and wait for the maple syrup at the bottom there. But if you're signed up for the Mito Life Academy, just know videos are coming. Thank you for your patience. Uh, sometimes they're bunched up where you get two or three in the middle of the month, and that'll likely be uh, this month. I'm also working on coming out with my uh, whole food vitamin C product for Mito Life. Uh, that's at mitolife.co is the website. And my vitamin C product will be out very soon, likely in the next week or two. So stay tuned to social media or the uh, email list on the Mito Life site and you'll get notified for that. Uh, finally caught up on the oyster extract supply. A lot of people have been waiting for that. Uh, as Lauren mentioned in the show, uh, selenium and iodine are uh, pretty crucial and it's really the balance that is crucial. So what's cool about the oyster extract is you get uh, iodine, zinc, copper, and selenium in the perfect forms and the perfect ratios because it's a whole food source. And it doesn't take much. You know, if you don't enjoy eating oysters, desiccated powdered oyster, like the MitoLife product, is really awesome because you just pop four in a day and you get your dose. Remember, these are trace minerals. So you need trace amounts, especially of iodine. One serving has just about 12 micrograms of iodine. And iodine is not required daily. You could just take it even once a week and that would be enough. And of course, there's context with mineral balancing and how much to take. I definitely front loaded my desiccated oyster uh, dosing when I first started on it. But the way I look at it, if you take oyster extract, beef liver, either the whole food or the pills and shilajit, you're really covered on your minerals. And then you're also doing dairy and maybe orange juice or fruit juice, you're doing potatoes and just eating in a balanced way and liberally salting your food, then you should have all your minerals covered. So thanks so much for listening. Uh, I have a new episode every Friday, uh, commercial free. Really excited for uh, the future guests on the show. I'm going to have a whole episode on chaga mushroom. Been getting back into that. And just chaga tea with maple syrup is so delicious. And you definitely feel the energy boost from it if you don't do well on coffee. And I'm also having an episode all about EMFs. I've only had one about that in the past. Uh, electromagnetic fields and the harmful effects, and most importantly, what to do about it that's beyond stickers, <laughs> that's not using stickers or quantum technology. And some of that stuff, I wouldn't say the stickers, but some of the you know quantum scalar stuff definitely works. And there's no placebo, because it works on animals too that can't be affected by placebo. But I think there's a lot of BS out there with EMFs, and a lot of people are pointing to a little quantum Usually if quantum's in the name, just walk away. 
<laughs> if it's an EMF device, because it most likely it doesn't work. So thanks so much for listening. Uh, please share the podcast with your friends. Uh, we're on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and YouTube. See you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged.